Good morning, everybody. I'm Pierre Talley. I'm the chair of the Family Medicine Forum Advisory Committee, and today my socks are red. Good morning. I'm uh, Debbie Smith. I'm the uh, co-chair of the uh, planning committee of the ASA um, for the of the uh, OCFP. So what we'd like to do first of all is to introduce all these great people on the stage. Well, maybe not all of them, just a few of them. The rest, they're just not very important. <laughs> so starting at the end is Dr. Cal Gucken, who is the executive director and CEO of the college. Of family Next, we have Dr. Sandy Buckman. He's the president of the uh, uh, CFPC. Ensuite, c'est Marie Dominique Beaulieu. C'est celle qui s'en vient bientôt. Next, we have Dr. Rob Boulay, uh, and he's the immediate past president of the CFPC. Next, we have Deborah Smith. And then Pierre Paul Tellier. <laughs> <laughs> and our keynote speaker, Dr. Mike Allen. <laughs> he's got a fan club. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Frank Martino, and he's the president of the OCFP. And f finally, but not least, Jan Kaspersky, who is the CEO of the Ontario College of Family Physicians. The rest, well, they did their job. They're here to come and see. And I guess you'll get introduced to them later. <laughs> so at this point, we have a few announcements so we can update you for um, the rest of the conference. Uh, so first of all, we want to remind you that if you haven't signed up for Walk for the Docs, walk for the docs, um, that you can still do that. That's tomorrow morning at um, <clears throat> 7 o'clock. I'll be in bed. Um, and that is really an, um, an effort to continue to raise money for the Research Education Foundation. This money goes to um, provide, provide uh, scholarships four medical students in Canada. 17 medical students received annually a scholarship of $10,000 to support them in their goal of attaining and uh, becoming family physicians. They are, it is also supported by Scotiabank and um, obviously other donations that the members will do throughout the year. Please join us if you want. Um, though, like me, I don't want. I'll just bid at the auction. It's much easier. Because um, you can do that. There's an auction in the, in the um, exhibit hall that you can bid on. And you don't have to walk. You could just bid. And that's another option. We'd also like to encourage you to um, visit the exhibit hall, including the very interesting display by Canadian Family Physician called The Faces of Family Medicine. It's an ongoing project which features our own members on the covers of the journal. So the display is um, located in the Humanities uh, Theater. And then just a reminder, Saturday will be uh, the convocation. That's uh, another important event for many of our members who have um, either finish their residencies or complete their um, credits, obtain their credits to become fellows. So come and honor these. And then that will be followed by um, a party that will be held uh, in the hall next door where we can sort of just celebrate the end of this fabulous week. Uh, so we hope that you enjoy another two days of this outstanding CME. 
I'd like to again thank the planning committee for putting together such a fabulous program. And um, thank you very much. Merci. Bonjour et bienvenue à tout le monde. Good morning. Uh, my name is Frank Martino. I'm the new president of the Ontario chapter, and I'd like to welcome everyone to sunny Toronto, home of the 2012 Grey Cup champion, Toronto Argonauts. <laughs> Not finished. And the 2013 Stanley Cup champion, Toronto Maple Leafs, <laughs> in absentia. This morning, I have the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming and introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Mike Allen. Uh, we're pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Allen here today. Dr. Allen is an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Alberta and the director of evidence-based medicine. He's been in practice approximately 15 years and presently works at the Northeast Community Center in Edmonton. Dr. Allen is the director of the Alberta College Family Physicians Evidence and CPD program, including the provincial CME roadshows. He is also a member of the Canadian Expert Drug Advisory Committee to advise federal and provincial health offices on prescribing formularies. Dr. Allen has given over 100 presentations and published over 30 articles. He's a slacker. He participates in a weekly uh, medical iTunes broadcast and writes a regular feature called Tools for Practice to the Alberta College of Family Physicians and the Canadian Family uh, Physician Journal. Dr. Allen's keynote address is called Baffled, Befuddled, and Bemused, How Not to Get Fooled Again, Again, and Again, and Again. His presentation deals with the conflicting and confusing nature of medical information, some of the reasons why it occurs, and he'll examine some of the myths and misinformation around chronic disease and common medical problems, while profiling some of the ways we get fooled trying to interpret the truth. Dr. Allen will also provide some practical information that can be applied immediately to improve patient care. This keynote will provide some valuable in, uh, insights to issues and situations that we all deal with in our own work, and helpful suggestions on how we can do what we do a little better. It's interesting, entertaining, and will provide some great take-home messages. If you haven't heard Dr. Allen, I think we're in for quite a treat. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mike Allen. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, as mentioned today, I'm going to try and cover the topic of baffled, befuddled, and bemused. And it's all around how we get tricked sometimes or fooled by the medical literature. But I wanted to start by saying I, I'd heard that Ontario was in financial crisis with their health care and that doctors' wages were being cut back and that kind of thing. So when I arrived, I went to my hometown and their usual fish and chip shop has now switched to being fish and hips. So I knew that the healthcare system was in real crisis when the fish and chip shops is doing hip replacement. My, my, my daughter suggested too that it might, they might be replacing human hips with fish hips because it looks like a hyphen there. Okay, so always the first thing I like to start with is the conflict of interest and what I like to talk about is the fact that I think conflict of interest is just more than who pays your salary or where you get funding from, but it's also what and who you are. So I'm a family doctor. I've been practicing for about 15 years, and um, I think that taints how I think about things compared to some of our other colleagues. I think more in a primary care kind of way, and I want to boil everything down to the simplest way it can be. I'm an academic, and what I do in academia is kind of review and summarize medical literature. That's my primary focus. But, and that's the important thing there is when I was in practice and not an academic, I could never have read the amount that I am now. In fact, if I could get one paper read a week, I was it was a real accomplishment, so that's it's relevant there. I get my pay from the University of Alberta and Alberta Health. Um, that's for the phys uh, physician services or patient care that I provide. And there's research and speaking fees from a variety of sources. The Alberta College of Family Practice is my main um, contributor right now for grants uh, to help us do what we do, but I've taken funding from Toward Optimized Practice, the Institute of Health Research, the Canadian Agency for Drug and Technology Health, um, and a whole bunch of sources, but I've never received any funding from industry. So, getting on to our talk. Science can, it's, 
times seem, can, can come across in a bunch of different ways. And sometimes it can be really obvious, like this. The state population is to double by 2040, and babies are to blame. <laughs> I would say to you that maybe babies aren't to blame, maybe their parents are to blame. <laughs> but regardless, that's relatively obvious. And sometimes it can see straight, just absolutely ridiculous, like this. Scientists to kill ducks to find out why they're dying. And that's kind of like, I don't know if any of you have been in that uh, you know, clinical situation where you're drawing blood all the time on this lady to find out why her CBC is going down or her hemoglobin is going down. Hmm, I wonder why. But a lot of the time, it can also seem very conflicting. And this is from the ACP Journal Club, which summarizes medical information for us. The first article says, Varenicline increases the risk of serious adverse cardiovascular events. The second article, published about 10 months later, in a summarized journal, these are the best articles out there, says varenicline does not increase the risk of cardiovascular events. So how is that possible? Well, actually, we're going to look specifically at this case, but it's, a, it's an example of how many times we get confused by the medical literature. And what I want to do first, though, we're going to go through a whole list of them as quickly as we can. The way I wanted to start, though, is how we miss often what really matters. So this sign says, caution, this sign has sharp edges, don't touch the edges of the sign, and in small print it says, the bridge is out ahead. Okay? And that's often how we look at things in medicine, and we don't even know we're doing it, but that's the kind of way we get duped. So let's go in. One of the best ways to get people thinking is actually not through statistics, which of course in my job I look at a lot, but through stories. So. This story is called The Surrogate Heart, and like all, it has to start the same way, once upon a time in a kingdom far, far away. And what I mean that, what I'm talking about is my, my clinic, but this was actually in CCUs, so. It was noticed that abnormal heartbeats followed heart attacks, and that the more there were of these abnormal beats, the higher the risk of sudden death. Like any good clinician, we put two and two together and said, Let's give something to decrease these extra heartbeats and will increase survival. The medicine we gave decreased extra heartbeats by 80%. So if you had, in one hour, you had 100 extra heartbeats, it turned it into 20 extra heartbeats. So it was very effective. And so that's what we did. And all was good until, this often happens, some troublemaker comes along and asks questions like this. Are we really saving lives? And whenever someone bucks the status quo, what do we do to them? Right. So after his execution, the king said, we need to solve this riddle. Are we really saving lives? And so they decided to give this medicine or magic potion to one group and not to the other. After 10 months, here's what they found. Now, when you look at this blinded data, you would say, oh my god, why is the answer. We need to be giving patients more why because it's decreasing the mortality rate by almost 5%. The trick is that treatment is a placebo. The real treatment here is not giving the medicine that you think is working because over time we killed one in every 21 people given this medicine. That's in canide and flecainide to reduce extra heartbeats. It was the standard of care, and we were killing one in every 21 people. So this is a really good example for us to remember when we're basing it on an association or a theory. And I'm going to go through some of the talk around surrogate markers. I hope most of you know, but quite simply, a surrogate marker, ask yourself, can the patient feel what I'm trying to treat or prevent? If, if that's the case they can't, well, then it's a surrogate marker. Okay? An example of that would, I ask you, how many patients came into your office last week and said, you know, doc, my microalbuminuria is really bothering me today. <laughs> they don't come to see you for that. They can't feel it. We have to make them worry about that. That's a surrogate marker. Okay? So how often do we have surrogate markers? How often do we worry about them? All the time. Okay? So let's go through some of these surrogate markers and find out what drugs we give to treat the surrogate marker and if they actually make a difference for patients. We're going to start first with a drug you probably haven't even heard of. It's called torcitrabib. The reason you haven't heard of it, it's unique in that it did not require simply to change surrogates to get FDA approval. It required more than that. It tried to prove that it actually worked. That actually bit them. 
So torsotrabib reduces LDL by 25% and increases HDL by 70%. It is the king of lipid drugs. It does more for lipids than any other pill. If you had an HDL of one, it could turn it into 1.7. It reduced, did it reduce cardiovascular disease? No, it actually increased cardiovascular disease and increased mortality. The perfect lipid drug made things worse for our patients. Is that the only one? Well, of course not. Niacin was just studied in a trial called AIM High, and what they found in AIM High was that when you give niacin with a statin, you make no difference for patients in important outcomes that they can actually feel, like a heart attack or stroke. Sure, you change their HDL, but actually nothing else changes, and in fact, the trial was stopped early because the trend was for an increased rate in strokes by adding niacin. Acetamide. Acetamide is a great drug for reducing LDL, but what does it do to prevent heart attacks and strokes, which is really the reason we give it? Well, it doesn't do anything. In multiple clinical trials now, it's been well documented that acetamide does not change anything. There's one clinical trial that is supposed to definitively answer this question, and it has already been extended twice because they can't seem to find any benefit from this drug. And the only time it's been compared against another drug, it was compared against niacin, which I just told you doesn't do anything. So how did niacin fare against acetamide? It was better. <laughs> so you do the math. Blood pressure is interesting. It's probably the closest we have to a real surrogate marker that seems as we reduce blood pressure, to a certain point, we reduce outcomes. But two drugs in particular, atenolol and doxazosin, don't seem to do much. In fact, atenolol, when compared to placebo, has the same effect, even though it's reducing blood pressure, and when compared against other drugs, has, no effect, or is, has worse outcomes compared to other drugs. Rosiglitazone is a great example of our enthusiasm to glom onto surrogate markers. When rosiglitazone came along, we wanted to take, many endocrinologists advocated that we take um, rosiglitazone as the first drug to be prescribed for diabetes because it did such a great job and seemed to have so few adverse events. Those adverse events we later found out were an increase in myocardial infarction, an increase in congestive heart failure, and an increase in fracture. There was no positive outcomes for this drug other than surrogate markers. In fact, many diabetes drugs, we really don't know if they're doing anything but changing sugars. And one of my favorites, because I love in medicine where we glom onto a fashion, we sure jumped on board with CRP, or at least some people did, and if you're really interested in reducing CRP, vitamin E does that quite well, but it increases mortality in one in 180 people. Rosiglitazone does a better job than metformin reducing CRP, and yet it has better outcomes than rosiglitazone, metformin does. And one of my favorite drugs for reducing CRP and treating cardiovascular disease, prednisone. Prednisone does a great job reducing CRP, and if you believe the theory of CRP, you would think then it would reduce cardiovascular disease. But I ask you, how many of you want to go home now and prescribe prednisone for your cardiovascular patients? Clearly. So these things are flawed. The next thing I wanted to talk about was how drugs work and how we can sometimes get led down a garden path. How many of you have seen a presentation where someone has put up a slide like this showing how their drug works? It's all fancy. You can't follow it but you have to take it on faith that something magical is happening, okay? One of my friends says when he looks at one of these, he knows right away, oh, that means they don't have any real data. <laughs> so when I look at this, this is how I react. Okay. So this leads me to a point of something just makes sense, so let's do it that way. And that is where do suppositories fit in? So which way do you put a suppository in, A or B? It's shaped like a torpedo, people. Come on. It's got to go one direction. So most of us have been putting A in first. And we actually have a clinical trial that has looked at this, believe it or not. And I would say to you, this is a lot more relevant information than most clinical trials we have. So this, is, this found that if you insert A first, 83% of the time you needed to introduce your finger. So that's a bad outcome. Three. 3% of the time, the suppository comes out. If you do the wrong end first, it works way better. 1% of the time you need to introduce your finger, it doesn't come out again, and 98% of people find that easier. Now, how many of you would have thought of that? Would have thought that it, if I do it the wrong way, it's going to be better? 
But this is a classic example for us. We look at something, we seem to have a little bit of understanding of what's going on, and we make a bunch of leaps without confirming whether it really works or not. These are some drugs that, we, that, that work, and we have no idea why they work. We can't even postulate well. You can read theories about lots of things, like vitamin D for falls. Why does vitamin D work for falls? There's actually pages, if you read the articles, on how they think it works, but it's all supposition. We don't really know. But one in every 15 um, elderly, frail people will avoid a fall that year if you give it to them. Okay? So that's just some of the ones. But it goes the other way, too. There's drugs that should work that don't work. Oral hormone replacement therapy for incontinence. I was taught that women became incontinent after menopause because they lacked estrogen and the pelvic floor was relaxing. If you gave hormone replacement therapy, it would help them because it would strengthen the pelvic floor. What has been well documented is that if you give HRT to a woman with incontinence, you will worsen the incontinence. If a woman doesn't have incontinence and you give oral HRT, you can increase the chance that she'll get it. So that is exactly the opposite of what we think should work. And my favorite of all on this list, which I'll jump to the bottom, is lubricant on a speculum. How many of you have heard, if you use lubricant on a speculum, you can disrupt the quality of the pap test? How many of you have heard that? Okay. That is teaching. It's actually in guidelines. Within the last year, I've seen a new guideline come out saying, don't use lubricant on a speculum. There are four clinical trials that have actually looked at this, and none have found lubricant has any impact. It does reduce pain during the pelvic exam. So why does this persist? There is, a, there is a study out there that shows it does disrupt the pap test. Here's what they did. They put the speculum in, they coated the cervix in lubricant, <laughs> then sampled it and said, yeah, it was a little bit obscured. So if, if any of you out there right now are coating the cervix in lubricant during the pelvic exam, I want you to stop. But otherwise, please go ahead and use lubricant because it reduces pain and has no impact on the pap test. Okay? So the next thing I want to talk about that can fool us is statistics. Okay? And here's how we get, here's an example of getting tricked. <laughs> statistics show teen pregnancy drops off significantly after age 25. So there might be a reason for that. It's not clear to me. But one of the ways we get fooled is absolute risk and relative risk. And one of the things that I always think is, you really don't know where you are unless you understand where you started from. So if I told you something reduce your risk by 50%, that sounds really good. But what if you had almost no chance of getting it? What I'm going to do is give you an example here of a drug that works very, uh, an intervention that works quite well for a, in, for a condition that doesn't happen as often as maybe we think although I'm not suggesting at all that it's not a reasonable intervention. And that's Zostervax, or for shingles. So it reduces shingles by about 70%, up to 70%, between 50 and 70. I want to show you the real numbers. So this is between age 50 and 59. I converted this trial to a three years just to make it easier to follow, and then over age 60. If you are 50 to 59, your chance of getting shingles within three years is 2%. The vaccine will take that to 0.6%. Your absolute benefit is 1.5%. The relative benefit is about 70%. Okay? But the actual benefit is 1.5 or so. And you need to vaccinate 70 people for, to have one avoid getting a shingles, a shingles episode. Okay? So over three years, you'll need to vaccinate 60 to 70 patients for one to avoid a shingles episode and you'll need to vaccinate 350 for one to avoid a post-herpetic neuralgia episode. Okay? So it's not that the vaccines don't work, I'm not talking about that at all, I'm just saying the promotion of the number of 50 to 70 can be misleading for patients. Okay? So when I tell them the number that, they need, that I need to vaccinate, it's like 60 to 70, some of them decline, some of them go forward, partly driven by the fact that it costs $200. Statistics is an also interesting thing in that it can prove that the average human has one testicle and one ovary. Okay? So, in this example, I want to show you another way that, that statistics leads us astray, and that's statistical significance. 
Now, I want you to read, this is from one of the websites for heart medications and that kind of thing. It's heart.org. And it says Aristotle, which is the study of apixaban, which is like the bigotran for atrial fibrillation. And it said it's a major win. It's the most positive yet. And it's the first of three new oral anticoagulants to show a clear, significant reduction in all-cause mortality. I'm going to show you the data, and I want you to tell me if it's absolutely clear to you. These are the two trials, apixaban and dabigatran. The one line, the one that's marked one, means the no effect. Can you see a difference between these two? Apixaban's on the left and dabigatran's on the right. They're pretty much identical. So I thought I'd do you a favor and I'd magnify it. Can you see a difference yet? Actually, if you look to Bigatran, the point estimate, the effect size, is a little bit lower, meaning that it might be better at reducing mortality. You have to go 30 times the size and look at fractions of a percent before you see that the Bigatran just barely touches the no effect line and a Pixaban does not. That's the difference. We chose an arbitrary cutoff for statistics, and I want to remind you that the p-value of 0.05 is arbitrary. And when something touches that, it suddenly becomes inconsequential. It doesn't exist. And when it's 0.0499999, it's 100% real. And that's how crazy we become about these numbers. So this is an example of how we get led astray, thinking that a Pixaban may be bigger than Dabigat may be better than Dabigatran, when actually they're exactly the same. This is the example that I gave you before about varenicline and the cardiovascular risk. You can see these are almost identical as well, but the BMJ one, which is the one that said it doesn't work, slightly crosses over the no effect line. What bothers me about this is as clinicians, we don't really know what the truth is if we don't dissect this down and we need people doing that, pulling these things apart. In this case, if you've got someone who's post-MI at the highest risk possible, their increased risk of a cardiovascular event is somewhere around 1 in 60 for the short time that they're on it, maybe that high. If you've got someone coming in who's smoking and younger and otherwise healthy, except for their smoking, the chance of harming them is far greater than 1 in 600. So we need to understand what is the real risk, not whether in absolute terms yes or no. We need to have a better understanding. We need scientists to start to back away from these absolute cutoffs so that they can get their paper published. I mean, that's what a lot of this kind of thing is about. The next thing I wanted to talk about briefly was meta-analysis. You probably heard this was published in a meta-analysis. And you think, well, they combined all those studies. It has to be real. But not all those studies are the same. And it's kind of like eating a stew or something like that, and you're not quite sure what the mystery meat was. Sometimes it wasn't chicken. <laughs> and so you have to, I want to show you an example of this. And we're, we're very seduced by the idea of getting a single true answer from a bunch of different studies. And uh, scientists are keen on this too, because it's, an, it's a relatively easy thing to do. In fact, for just home glucose monitoring, we've had more than 10 systematic reviews all basically saying the same thing, with different interpretations though, and four in the last two years. I want to show you aggressive management of blood glucose and how we've been so confused about this information. The bottom diamond at the very bottom of this slide is right on the no effect line, meaning that managing sugar has no effect on cardiovascular mortality. But it completely neglects these two studies because it combines them together, meshes them, and says a single answer that isn't true. If you look at the A, that is the UK PDS 34, that's giving about 50-year-old people who are brand new diabetics without many other conditions metformin. Okay, That's what that's about. B is a little bit different. It's about giving 60-year-olds with multiple comorbidities um, multiple drugs to drive down their sugars well below 7. It's a totally different approach. To combine those, we miss out on the nuance of managing diabetes. What we know is that giving drugs early to moderately control sugar, not driving them down to sixes, but getting them around sevens and maybe a little less in brand new diabetics with low risks, especially with metformin, will improve outcomes. But aggressively managing them once they've gone on in their condition for a while can actually increase mortality. So this leads me to another thing that I wanted to talk about briefly, that the worst part about censorship is it's on a need-to-know basis. 
<laughs> so many of you already know that funding bias, who pays for a study, actually drives what the results are. I don't want to dwell on that, but I want to show you actually the nuance, which I think is really interesting, of how it actually happens. This is one of, my most, one of the things that I found most interesting, because I thought that many of our outcomes in medicine were objective. And I figured out that really there's only one objective outcome, and that's death. And everything else is open to interpretation. So this is from the FDA, and they had the original data for the use of rosiglitazone, and this compares placebo and rosiglitazone for myocardial infarctions. On the left, you'll see that the dotted line, which is rosiglitazone, is barely above the solid line, meaning that there's not much difference between them. The FDA was suspicious of this, and they asked to see the original patient records. And when they looked at the patient records, they thought a lot more MIs were happening than were being reported. That turned the objective finding of an MI into something subjective. And they found, as you see on the plot on the right, that the number of MIs in rosiglitazone was far higher than those in the placebo group. And when, now what I call this, when people look at data and see different things, I call that looking through rosy colored glasses. The other thing I think we should change the name of is SSRIs, to super selective release of information. <laughs> and the reason is, is there's 74 trials submitted to the FDA, and of those, 38 of those studies were positive, and 34 were negative. If they were positive, 37 of them were published. If they were negative, 14 were published. And of that 14, 11 were published as positive, even when they were negative. <laughs> So in other words, well, we had less adverse events, or people had a better sense of well-being, even though that wasn't our outcome. But I think that this study is important. I think this one, which is actually older and from the BMJ uh, in Melander, by a guy named Melander, is probably the best study of this. It's busy, so you'll have to stay with me. But the circles in the middle are clinical trials. If they're red, that means they were positive clinical trials they found in favor of the drug. If they're blue, that means they were negative. The diamonds that come off those are single publications. You'll notice the first red circle is published twice. Two diamonds come off it. What's interesting is they had different authors, and they were published in different journals, and made no reference to each other most of the time. So you would perceive that as reading two, uh, two different studies of benefit for this product. More so, that, that information was take, taken and pooled in other studies. So that study alone makes its way into five different publications to promote this product. So it's not only that trials are being hidden, but you're also taking good trials and publishing them again and again. Now, it's very easy to kind of jump and say, whoa, e evil industry is at work again. But what I find fascinating is a lot of what's going on here. There is financial interest, but there's also human nature. Because publicly funded research, 40% of publicly funded researchers manipulate or modify their data before publication. They have no financial incentive to do so, but they do it 40% of the time. Now, I was in the military, so I can put this slide up, and I can tell you that there were many sergeants who took me to the range and saw how incredibly sloppy I was that would have loved me to do this but stand with the, with the actual target in front of me. Um, but target shooting is a problem that we have in medicine. I wanted to deal with it a bit. We've come to a point now where we believe that the best number for all of these kind of things is approaching zero. If we get closer to zero, pretty soon the cholesterol, the LDL target you're going to be after is zero. And there'll be no more making cholesterol, sex, steroids, nothing, because we won't have any cholesterol left. But darn, we'll be healthy. <laughs> so you can't be too rich or too low. This is an important point. How many of you thought that there were studies of cholesterol medicines that looked at hitting targets? How many of you thought that? There are none. There are no studies of hitting targets. Even the study called Treat to New Targets was a dose study. It gave people 10 milligrams or 80 milligrams of atorvastatin. And if they got to target and you were in the 10 milligram group, they didn't give you less. And if you were in the 80 and you didn't get to target, they didn't give you something else on top of it. Okay? So there's really no evidence to support targets at all, and there's lots of great articles that have reviewed the information and say that what we need to be doing is giving patients 
who are moderate risk a statin and giving those who are higher risk a higher dose statin, whatever they can tolerate. Blood pressure, as I mentioned to you, has good evidence, but once we're getting below 140, it starts to fall apart a bit. The European um, Hypertension Society, they've actually backed off and said anywhere between 130 and 140 is fine for diabetes and, and people with uh, um, cardiovascular disease. And recently, the CHEP guidelines is going to be backing off their recommendations for renal disease and putting it back to 140. In diabetes, we've seen a real turnaround because the best you can hope for is about a 10 to 15 percent reduction in cardiovascular events with them, and that's if you take it out 10 to 17 years. But we know that aggressive management actually increases mortality. So what you're seeing is the European and the American diabetes associations have now reversed and are saying seven for most people, but a lot of people will be better off at seven and a half and sometimes even up to eight. Even with rate control, we overstepped our bounds there and said less than 80 was so important when one clinical trial documented very clearly that less than 110 is just as good for our AFib patients. And that's because we live in a world of J-curves. So this is the J-curve in the top left of A1C. And you'll see the best A1C for survival, that's a survival curve, is 7.5 to 8 for long-standing diabetics. And the diastolic is below, and you'll see that after you get below 60, the increase in car there's an increase in cardiovascular events by aggressive blood pressure control. And the last one is BMI, and this should make all of us happy. I've told my wife I'm absolutely letting myself go. Um, so this is, uh, that was a little exaggeration. Um, but for, particularly for patients over age 65, between 25 and 30 is the ideal BMI for them for long-term survival. So what you thought was this, this is ideal. <laughs> that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but... Okay, so I'd like to leave you a little bit with what to do, because there's a lot of information here. And I think the first thing is always the same from me whenever you hear me talk. Treat patients first. Don't worry about surrogate markers. Don't worry about numbers, and certainly don't worry about theories of medicines. If you're like me, when you were in medical school, giving beta blockers in heart failure was a sin. And we had great theory of why that was. Then we found out it worked, and then we changed our theory, which we do so frequently. So don't worry about theories, worry about treating patients. I also recommend you find a trusted resource. I'm biased, so I think it should be in primary care. I think it should be based on people who understand evidence and have minimal external influence. So I'm going to give you some examples of that. ACP Journal Club makes the best guidelines. I'm not a big fan of guidelines, but if you're looking for an unbiased source of guidelines, the ACP Journal Club are the best that we have out there, I think. InfoPoems is done by a family doctor in the US, and I think that's an excellent resource as well. CADETH is the Canadian Agency for Drug and Technology Health. They do a good review of evidence, and so does NICE from Britain. Always remain skeptical. Now, I've got one more slide to show you because I'm going to do a little bit of shameless advertising. These are the things that I do. Tools for Practice and the Therapeutics Education Collaboration. Tools for Practice is funded by the Alberta College, and every two weeks we answer a clinical question summarizing the best evidence down to 350 words and give you a bottom line answer how to apply it with real numbers. Okay? You can look at our website, it has actually all the old archives on it, up to 75 of them now, and every two weeks we'll mail one out to you. And the last thing is the Therapeutics Education Collaboration. It's a podcast on iTunes, it's usually around number one or three, um, and it's, uh, it's kind of a goofy kind of look at evidence, and we try to make a little bit of fun of ourselves as well as tell you summary information of recent evidence. So it's time for me to stop. And I'd love to take questions, but I realize that that will be difficult in this room. So if we don't get to take questions, I'm more than happy if you see me after the presentation or sometime in the hall. I'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much. Well, that was wonderful, Mike. Um, 
certainly it's going to make us rethink the way we practice. And I believe that stu uh, physician stewardship is a really important uh, endeavor that most uh, family doctors will need to go through, um, both in their practices and in that uh, uh, medical lounge that we've often forgot about to discuss items like this. So thank you again. I think uh, you know presentations like that obviously challenge all of us. Uh, it was mentioned earlier this morning that tomorrow evening, and we hope uh, many of you will join us for convocation and our awards ceremony and then the party after. But at convocation, we are acknowledging all of our new certificates in family medicine in Canada, our new fellows. And I think uh, based on Mike's talk, we now know that those who you will see receiving certification are those who know the right end of a suppository to put in first. <laughs> It is, uh, you see all of us in, uh, in uh, regalia here this morning, and the reason for that is because uh, this is a formal ceremony with the installation of our new president of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And it was our pleasure to have Mike provide this stimulating keynote address as an introductory part of that. But what we're going to do is move on to the uh, actual ceremony itself. Uh, Pierre Paul and Debbie mentioned that uh, only some of the platform party were introduced, and the very significant part of the platform party was saved for this special ceremony, because on the platform with us, we have many of our past national presidents of the College of Family Physicians of Canada, and it's part of our ceremony that they really act as the official witnesses prior to the installation and the address from our new president uh, at that time. So I'd like to begin by introducing and asking each to stand and remain standing as uh, they are introduced, the past presidents of the College of Family Physicians of Canada who are with us here this morning. To my right at, in the second row, Dr. Reg Perkin, who was president in 1981-1982, and of course, as most of you know, was also the executive director of the college from 1985 to 1996. Dr. Donald Butt, who was president of the college in 1985-86. Dr. Brian Hennon, president 1989-1990. Dr. Jamie Boyd, 1991-92. Dr. Marco Terwheel, 1992-93. Dr. Sherry Bethune, 1996-97. Dr. Francine Lemire, 1998-99. And Francine Lemire is going to be the executive director and CEO of our college beginning January the 1st. Join me in wishing her the very best. Dr. Donald Gellhorn, President 2000-2001. Dr. Peter McKean, 2002-2003. Dr. Rob Waddell, 2003-2004. Dr. Alain Pavelanis, 2004-2005. Dr. Louise Naismith, 2005-2006. Dr. Tom Bailey, 2006-2007. Dr. Ruth Wilson, 2007-2008. Dr. Sarah Credenzer, 2008-2009. Dr. Kathy McLean, 2009-2010. Dr. Rob Boulay, President in 2010-2011. Thank you very much, our past presidents. We're honored to have all of them here with us and to act as our official witnesses of the ceremony about to take place. 
We also have with us members of our current executive committee and some of the presidents of our chapters that are here with us. They're in the front row. Will you please stand and be recognized? Dr. Ian Goldstein from Manitoba, Dr. Antoine Grou from Quebec, Dr. Susan Atkinson of Nova Scotia, and our, our uh, additional college executive members, Kathy Lawrence from Saskatchewan and Gary Mazawita from British Columbia. I'd also like you to join me with a special welcome to uh, some special guests who've been with us for our board meetings and uh, staying with us for our, our uh, scientific assembly, the president of the American Academy of Family Physicians, Dr. Jeffrey Kane, <laughs> and the president of the World Organization of Family Doctors North America Region, Wonka North America, Dr. Dan Ostergaard, who's here with his wife, Ruth. Our outgoing president, who will be taking the podium in a moment and beginning the installation and handing over the reins to our new president, our pres current president is Dr. Sandy Buckman. Sandy is from Toronto. Sandy is a family physician who has been a dedicated leader in our discipline and in our college for many years. He was president of the Ontario College of Family Physicians, assumed his role on our National Executive Committee and has an, had an absolutely outstanding year as our national leader. I've had the privilege of working closely with Sandy as I've had that same privilege with other presidents. And it's been an, an amazingly busy year and this is an individual who is passionate, wise, incredibly capable of standing before audiences and explaining complex issues and gaining the support and answering questions that require understanding. He himself has a particular interest in palliative care and is a leader in palliative care in the Toronto area. But he's been a leader as well in what some of our major initiatives, the patient's medical home, the triple C curriculum, and the reaching out to family physicians with special interests, just as he has, but understanding that these should be special interests that are part of a, a real strategy of comprehensive family medicine. Fa uh, Sandy and his wife, Gail, have been an outstanding first couple for us as a college. Uh, at this particular time, I would like you to join me in thanking our leader for the past year, our outgoing president, Dr. Sandy Buckman. And I would like to now call upon Dr. Buckman to carry out the ceremony. To begin with his State of the College Address. Uh, good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Thank you, Cal, for the uh, kind words and introduction. Um, it's my great privilege and pleasure this morning to be able to uh, present the State of the College Address uh, to you. And first, the good news. Well, there's no bad news coming, but we got lots of good news. Um, the first is that our uh, CFPC membership is really uh, on a very uh, steep slope uh, trajectory. We have over 28,000 members now across Canada. And, there, and we have an incredibly large number of uh, PGY1s. Uh, we're now over 1,300, when we only uh, 811 just uh, some uh, five, six short years ago. Some more statistics. Um, our number of family medicine training sites is increasing remarkably too. You compare it to 1996 when there was only 25, we now have 147 uh, family medicine training sites. And again, first say the bad news was that we hit an ADIR, a low in, in 2003 when only 25 per, 24% of uh, medical students were choosing family medicine as, the, as their career choice. And now we're up to 35% and we feel we're going to reach 40% our target sometime soon. We're looking at governance, and we have a governance advisory committee under the, uh, uh, under the chair, chaired by Dr. Sarah Credenzer, one of our uh, past presidents, and we're looking at an ongoing continuous review of our governance model, looking at our whole board structure and how our, our relationship as a national college with our chapters and between chapters as well. I'm pleased to announce as well that we've approved a new strategic plan in uh, 2000 and for 2020. 13 to 2017. As most of you know, uh, 
Our vision of family medicine in the 21st century is the model of the patient's medical home. Um, on the slide, you'll see the key aspects of the patient's med medical home, which include the time, patient-centered care, um, timely access to not only primary care to providers, but other elements within the healthcare system, such as our hospitals, our specialist colleagues, public health. That home will provide the hub for those linkages. We know that associated with the patient's medical home are better health outcomes. We, uh, we promote uh, prevention and wellness and, uh, and provide chronic disease management. Quality of care is emphasized as well as patient safety. It's comprehensive and coordinated and there's continuity with all the providers, providers in a full interdisciplinary team. We know it's sustainable and you get the best value for your healthcare dollar. We continue to uh, work on beginning to implement the patient medical home concept. Under the uh, a chair of Dr. Rob Odell, also one of our four um, our, uh, past presidents, where uh, we have the um, advisory committee on family practice. And they've undertaken to produce, uh, give us guidance on producing guides and workbooks to assist in transforming family practices to the patient medical home model. We're developing handbooks on access, on panel size, rostering, etc. Over the next five years, we're going to be developing even more of that. We want to uh, give advice to policymakers and other healthcare professionals, develop web based tools. Uh, another past president, uh, Dr. Rob Boulay, uh, with Dr. Waddell, is chairing an implementation committee on this issue. We're trying to work extensively with our chapters on uh, engaging the provincial governments and develop patient medical home champions. This is currently underway, for example, in New Brunswick as we speak. With regards to uh, policy, um, a lot of time is spent looking at the, uh, the uh, referral consultation process. Um, we have an organization called the Collaborative Action Committee on Interprofessionalism, again chaired by past president Dr. Louise Naismith, and uh, really trying to look at both our referral and the consultation and the two-way direction of our relationship with our specialist colleagues. Under almost another past president, that's uh, my responsibility, I'm chairing a task force on the relationship between our college and the pharmaceutical and health industry. Um, it's really looking at organizational conflict of interest. This is about our credibility and the trust in our organization um, by our members and by the public. In June 2008, the uh, the board of the CFPC approved the establishment of the section of family physicians with special interest and focused practices. And now we have a council, again, past president uh, chairing that, Dr. Tom Bailey. And the prime objectives of this initiative, which are really key, are to strengthen comprehensive continuing care in family practice. How do we bring in this, this diverse number of uh, family physicians with their special interests? So really to support uh, and needs of both the broad scope family physicians and those with special interest. To date, we have about 16 programs that have been approved, ranging from uh, palliative care to mental health to addiction medicine. And each program has a mandate to address the following, network and communications, advocacy, policy development, um, advising us regarding the core family res residency curriculum and those core competencies uh, in, family, in, in family medicine. It also is helping us to consider uh, developing advanced skills residency and ways to get to a certificate of added competence and or a special designation in those areas. To date, over 1,800 members have indicated interest in one of these 16 programs. So with regard to the, the concept of uh, certificates of added competence and special designations, um, this was approved by our board um, to be awarded in areas that meet uh, board approved criteria. We have the criteria currently emergency medicine, palliative care, uh, sports and exercise medicine, care of the elderly and anesthesia are undergoing this process. The real challenge again is to determine what are the core competencies for a family medicine graduate and what would be the enhanced or added competencies beyond that. We really, um, we really must meet the triple C competency-based curriculum in determining these core competencies. Um, the practice-eligible pathways will be a priority for us. These will definitely be non-exam routes to get to uh, certification, to get to certif certificate of added competence. Um, in addition, um, our certification in family medicine, our CCFP exam, will be launched as a harmonized exam in the spring of 2013 for the first time. So that's, a, that's an exam that puts together both our CCFP certification and the Medical Council of Canada Part 2. Candidates who meet our CF, 
CCFP standards will also be granted their LMCC Part 2, but candidates who fail to meet the CFPC standard may still pass the, uh, uh, the Medical Council of Canada Part 2 exam, and that will be determined by the Medical Council of Canada Examination Committee. In our portfolio of academic family medicine, we're uh, really moving strongly forward with the C competency-based curriculum. Uh, and most of you know, C stands for Comprehensive Education and Patient Care, Continuity of Education and Patient Care, and is centered in family medicine. And it, C is in different phases of implementation across the country. We're working with their different departments of family medicine uh, in this process at this time. Um, a great toolkit is available on our website. There are some other academic initiatives going on. Um, we've developed reciprocity agreements or mutual recognition of certification uh, with uh, certain countries. That's the US, Ireland, Australia, and the UK. Uh, we just recently signed a reciprocity agreement with the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine. Uh, Main Pro is also undergoing changes. Um, as most of you are also probably aware, revalidation of medical licensure and mandating continual professional development now exist in, mo in most pro provinces, and our Main Pro requirements meet the mandatory CPD requirements of these uh, medical regulatory authorities. A working group is uh, currently reviewing the future of Main Pro and the CPD requirements for maintenance of membership, certification, and fellowship. And the board approved a couple of changes for January 1st. Um, you will have to submit your uh, main pro credits online at that time, and there's going to be a minimum annual main pro credit requirement of 25 credits per year. You know, family medicine research is becoming increasingly uh, important, and we have to support our uh, family medicine researchers um, increasing their capacity to do research. And we've just, one of our main strategic priorities in our, in our new strategic plan is the uh, enhancing the capacity of family medicine research. Um, uh, there are two main projects going on currently at the, at the present time. Um, in partnership with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and the Canadian Medical Association, we are, uh, we are the other partner in the National Physician Survey, which we're preparing right now for the survey going out in 2013. Um, the Canadian Primary Care Sentinel Surveillance Network uh, in, in gathering data about chronic disease um, across Canada in family physicians' offices is also underway. Um, with regard to collaboration, um, we have our portfolio of uh, government relations in September 2012. Uh, Cal I, Francine Lemaire, um, our uh, director of government relations, Eric Mang, went to Ottawa really on um, a mission of advocacy, first to promote the patient's medical home, and, but also to advocate for national standards and monitoring across the country in health care. Um, we really tried to reinforce the importance of primary care and that this really improves health outcomes. We also did a lot of advocacy on, uh, with the government in terms of the intern federal health program and, um, and the legislation that excluded refugees from health care in Canada. And now really just a, a final, uh, I guess, personal note of gratitude. My wife Gail tells me no is a full sentence, <laughs> but she also helps me make good choices. And one of those was saying yes to the presidency of the college. This has been one of the best yeses of my life. It's really maybe second only to saying yes to marrying her. <laughs> I wish to thank her and my family for their unwavering support. My gratitude also extends to my colleagues at the Tammy Latner Center for Palliative Care in Toronto, the Family Practice Unit at Mount Sinai Hospital, and the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Special thanks go out as well to the board my executive for their wisdom and guidance and support and participation, to the chapter presidents and staff across the country for their warmth and hospitality, and to the fabulous senior and admin staff at the CFPC. Really, they are the very best. A special mention of appreciation to our departing CEO, Dr. Cal Gutkin, for his incredible mentorship and leadership by example, and to my patients and their families, for really allowing me to get, dedicate myself to the, to the position this year, to the presidency, and uh, who truly teach us what I needed to know to do this job. And to my family, physician, friends, and colleagues across the country, our members, for their incredible support, friendship, and guidance. It's been an absolute honor and privilege to serve as president of this great organization. Thank you so much for providing me with the opportunity to do so. Merci beaucoup.
Thank you. And now, as my last official duty, it is my honor and privilege to officially install my successor, Dr. Marie Dominique Beaulieu of Montreal, Quebec, as the 2012 2013 president of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. Je demande à Dr. Beaulieu de se lever. Dr. Beaulieu, one year ago you were chosen president elect, and by virtue of the bylaws you're about to assume the presidency the highest office in the College of Family Physicians of Canada. With your agreement to assume this office, do you accept the trust your peers have placed in you to become the leader and main spokesperson for the College of Family Physicians of Canada? I do. And Dr. Beaulieu, as our college president, do you agree to commit to carrying out your official duties and upholding the dignity and principles of this office by serving our college, its chapters, our members, and the specialty of family medicine with professionalism and honor. I do. Je veux confirmer maintenant l'insigne officiel du Collège des médecins de famille du Canada, la médaille présidentielle. As I pass to you the presidential medal, the symbol of office for the ensuing year, I know you will wear it with pride, honor, and humility. At the close of your term, you will pass it on to your successor as a symbol of progress, loyalty, and devotion to the principles of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. times. So it, it's a privilege for my first duty as president to honor our outgoing president, Dr. Sandy Bachman. Thank you. But I do not have the pen. I don't have the pen. The pen. Give me mine. I'm giving you yours. Well, I have to give you. <laughs> yeah, they, they won't. No, no pen. <laughs> so uh, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you, Sandy, this past president pin as a token of appreciation of your efforts and achievements on behalf of our college over the, the past year. Okay. So, Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Merci okay. beaucoup, Sandy. Thank you. So I, I will say a few words. Dr. Buckman, Dr. Gutkin, all other stage guests, distinguished past presidents of the College of Family Physicians of Canada, members of our board, members of the College of Family Physicians of Canada, dear guests and friends, chers amis et invités, ladies and gentlemen. Well, this is certainly the most important moment in my professional life, and I am deeply moved. A year ago, you, the members of our college, accepted my candidacy as the next president of our organization. I thank you for placing your trust in me, and the day has come, it is today. So I would like to take a few minutes to share with you how I see the challenges facing us and how I, most humbly, I will see my role this year. I will begin just by say, uh, saying a few words about, about my journey so you know me a little bit better. Um, and 
I'll begin with saying that uh, I did two ma make uh, two major decisions in my life. I'm thinking, Sandy, we're, we're going to talk about the same decisions that we've made in our lives. So um, the first one, chronologically, uh, was actually to choose family medicine at the end of my undergraduate me medical study. And here I would like to thank, some of them are here, the, the teachers who helped me actually discover my passion for family medicine during those very important early training years. The second decision, but not the least, was to say yes to the man who was to become the man of my life, Laurier Boucher. J'ai consulté Laurier, bien sûr, avant de, de m'engager face à vous tous, car on m'avait bien averti que la présidence du Collège des médecins de famille du Canada, bien, c'est une affaire de famille. Je tiens ici à le remercier d'avoir accepté de m'accompagner et de m'appuyer inconditionnellement pendant toute cette année à venir. Ceux qui me connaissent savent combien la médecine familiale est, a toujours été et sera toujours une passion pour moi. J'ai débuté ma résidence en 1976. En fait, on en était au début de la médecine familiale au Québec. Très tôt, je me suis impliquée au Collège des médecins de famille du Canada, où j'ai rencontré des collègues de partout qui partageaient la même passion et qui travaillaient à établir notre discipline. C'est à ce moment-là que le Collège des médecins de famille est devenu ma famille professionnelle. So the college became very early on my professional family. And I remember actually the excitement of these years, which led to the first victory, I think, at the end of the 80s, that was the recognition of mandatory training for all family physicians. And that's when all new family physicians were actually trained as, family, as specialists in family medicine. But as the song goes, the times, they are a-changing, and we must continue to evolve, as we've always done, to meet new challenges. I would say that around 10 years ago, we really entered another period that to me, and I'm sharing with colleagues, is just as decisive, I think, and just as exciting as the 80s. It's a period where the crucial role of family physician in our healthcare system and the very specific na nature of our specialty were recognized. But it's also a period where methods of working are changing. It is, they're changing to, to take into account the growing complexity of healthcare problems and also the expectations of our patients and of their families and of the public in general. And in, in response to these challenges, the College of Family Physicians of Canada launched major initiatives dealing both with training and with the conditions of practice. Dr. Buckman has just presented them to you and all the, the initiatives we're involved in, but I would like to highlight three of these major initiatives that I see as, very, as being very interrelated and has the potential of a lot of impact and even be transformative. First, the evolution I was beginning to say the transformation, but it's really the evolution of our family medicine curriculum towards a competency-based curriculum that aims at complete and comprehensive care focused on continuity both in education and patient care and centered in family medicine, our triple C. The second very major initiative is the creation of the section and now the council of family physicians with special interests and focused practices in response to the needs of the communities in which they practice. And more recently, the policy statement on the patient medical home, which to my view proposes a modern and unifying vision of the organization of primary care in Canada. Toutes ces initiatives sont déterminantes, elles sont passionnantes et elles vont être exigeantes. Alors, je voudrais vous rassurer que je n'ai pas l'intention d'ajouter de nouveaux objectifs ou de nouvelles initiatives pendant mon année comme présidente. Je vois au contraire mon rôle en soutien de ces initiatives. 
These initiatives that we are embarking on are really exciting and demanding. So what I just said is that I want to re reassure you that I'm not going to add any major initiative during my, my residency. Mon rôle est avant tout de vous écouter, de vous comprendre, de comprendre vos intérêts professionnels et vos inquiétudes et de découvrir comment les médecins de famille et tous les autres professionnels avec qui ils travaillent innovent dans différents contextes de pratique qui font la richesse de notre discipline pour en témoigner partout où j'en aurai l'occasion. Mon rôle est aussi d'expliquer la vision qui anime notre collège, nos objectifs, et c'est pour cette raison que mon principal défi sera de me rendre disponible le plus possible pour être présente dans nos comités provinciaux, dans nos comités nationaux, qui sont la cheville ouvrière de notre organisation. So my, my most challenge, my biggest challenge for me will be to be available, to be there everywhere and to visit the, the, as many of you that I can throughout Canada. I must say that I would really like at one point some water, but there's no water around. Huh? We'll continue. I'm sorry about that. I would like to tell you, though, even if I am not uh, adding any objectives, uh, there are things that are dear to my mind, and I would like to tell you now about three issues that I attach a particular importance to, because I believe they are vital to the success of all our initiatives and uh, to our capacity of integrating all of that. The first is collaboration with other professional organizations and government. We talk a lot about uh, in, uh, interprofessional uh, collaboration, but I think we have also to consider interorganizational collaboration as something very important, because no organization can achieve actually effective change single-handedly. We are independent and we must work together. Thank you very much. The second is the synergy that must develop between clinical practice, research, and teaching. As many of you know, I have always had a comprehensive family practice, and I have also been involved in teaching. But I devoted a large part of my career to research in family medicine. That was my special interest, so to speak. And I am convinced that innovation can only arise from the synergy of these three major types of expertise. We have the good fortune to rely not only on 20, 000, uh, 28,000 clinicians, but also on a section of teachers and a section of researchers that are led both by national and international leaders. And I would like here to acknowledge them, and I promise to do all that I can to promote a successful collaboration around our major, major initiatives. And lastly, and I would say this could be considered the theme of my presidency, I would like to bring further the conversation of what patient-centered care would really mean in the next decade to come. The patient-centered approach is not a new concept in family medicine. This approach is one of our six uh, essential skills defined in our curriculum, and it is at the heart of our discipline. But 30 years after the seminal work of Dr. Ian McQueeny, who passed away recently and who we remembered yesterday morning when we opened this, uh, this uh, conference, the concept of patient-centered care is, uh, we can say, enjoying a second win. The Institute of Medicine included patient-centered care as one of the key dimensions of quality of care alongside safety, effectiveness, accessibility, efficiency, and equity. So the concept of patient-centered care goes beyond the sphere of the consultation. To paraphrase Dr. McQueeny, being patient-centered is not only a matter of seeing the disease through the patient's eyes, it is really seeing his or her entire healthcare experience through his or her eyes. eyes. Quelques exemples de questions que suscite l'approche centrée sur le patient. Comment peut-on organiser nos milieux cliniques pour qu'ils soient réellement centrés sur le patient, pas seulement dans le bureau de consultation, mais dès qu'ils établissent un contact avec nous, avec nos milieux cliniques? Comment collaborer avec des professionnels, nos collègues, non seulement pour être efficaces et travailler au meilleur de notre capacité et de, nos, de, de, de notre spécialité, 
mais d'une façon qui fait sens pour les patients et qui tienne compte de leurs contraintes et de leurs préférences. Comment définir des objectifs de soins pertinents pour des personnes aux prises avec des problèmes de santé complexes pour lesquels nos guides de pratique clinique sont d'utilité limitée? Pour trouver des réponses à ces questions, nous n'avons pas d'autre choix que de trouver de nouvelles façons d'établir des partenariats avec nos patients. To build a really patient-centered healthcare system, we must develop new forms of partnerships with our patients and their families. So during my presidency, I would like to take the opportunity when I meet with all of you to learn more about what you are doing, the processes you are putting in place to develop this patient-centered approach that we, that's so dear to us, to explore also how we can take it a step further. CFPC members are recognized leaders in patient-centered care, so I think we are very well equipped with our clinicians, our researchers, and our teachers to continue to demonstrate that leadership for a stronger patient-centered healthcare system. Voici donc brièvement comment j'entrevois l'année à venir. Pour conclure, c'est aujourd'hui pour moi le début d'un merveilleux périple et je vous remercie encore de m'avoir donné l'opportunité de mettre mon expérience et ma passion euh, au service de notre collège, dont le premier objectif est de se faire le champion de la qualité des soins de santé pour tous les Canadiens et Canadiennes. So, it's a marvelous journey that I begin right now, and, but I do know that I'm not uh, undertaking this journey alone. I am fortunate to be surrounded by all of you who make up the College of Family Physicians of Canada, and by all the healthcare professionals and organizations that share our vision of a healthcare system that champions quality healthcare. I thank you very much. the 58th President of the College of Family Physicians of Canada, Dr. Marie Dominique Boyot. Merci, Marie Dominique. I also would like to make mention, Marie Dominique mentioned her husband, and I just want you to all meet him so he can stand alone, Laurier Boucher. Please be recognized. And the family and friends that have come here this morning to uh, be with, uh, with Marie Dominique and us early this morning, why don't you rise and be recognized by all of us in the college as well. Sorry we didn't have the water for you, but it gave us a chance to exercise one of our principles, and that's that the youngest of the past presidents runs the errand. <laughs> Uh, I want to also just mention that uh, we have acknowledged uh, Dr. Rob Boulay, who is completing his tenure on our executive. He has now fulfilled his, not only his presidency, but his past presidency. This is the end of his time officially on the executive and in the, these leadership positions. It was mentioned that he has kindly agreed to take on the chairing of uh, one of our most significant ongoing initiatives, the Patients Medical Home Steering Committee, uh, working with Dr. Rob Boulay and Rob Waddell, another past president. But I would like you to join me in thanking Rob Boulay for his incredible long service leadership to the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And we've, we've acknowledged Sandy, and Sandy, we've, we will certainly always remember your contributions, and we want to also acknowledge uh, Gail. Gail Baker, Sandy's wife, who has basically, and you've heard this both when Sandy became president and again at the end of his time, how important that relationship and Gail's advice at all times is, and so we as a college, both directly and indirectly, when you're, we don't even see you, basically are being impacted by you. Gail, thank you so much for everything you've done, and on behalf of everyone in the college, we have a little something here for you.
<laughs> so we look forward to you enjoying the rest of our Family Medicine Forum and joining us tomorrow evening for Convocation and then the Family Medicine Forum Celebration, which is a great party. It will be, as Pierre Paul uh, mentioned earlier, just in the room adjoining here. We have a band, Slice of Life, which is, uh, if, for those of you who haven't experienced this group before, this is an outstanding Toronto-based band, which just happens to be comprised mostly of family physicians who are members of this college. So please join us. Have a great time the rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>